It's good to be back. I remember coming here uh, years ago and standing in front of a group and it was just to talk about uh, natural areas and restoration. And now this is seeing a crowd about the same size, but focused purely on uh, solar farms means that we have progressed. I mean, 30 years ago when I started the business, all of us could have probably sat around a kitchen table. So we, we, we have come a long way. Um, thanks, Vince, for the, the proposal and call, or the presentation and Colleen, because they brought up some really good points. Um, this isn't easy, and it's a challenge to do it, and you're gonna be working, uh, trying to put something back sometimes, let's say, putting a 10 pounds of stuff into a five gallon sack. Um, and this is, I'm, I'm never the cheerleader, but I'm, but I'm, but I'm also a, a big fan of this because this is not easy work to do. So um, we are four companies. We're uh, uh, design and eco or design and consulting, landscape architecture. Let's get this. Okay, work with me. There we go. Okay, and the, the nursery company as well. Um, Pizzo and Associates does the work. Native Landscape Contractors does the work as well, except that Native Landscape Contractors is a union company. So we can work on any job site that requires labor agreements. So we'll work right alongside your general contractors and everything and be able to work with them without incident, which can be a problem in Illinois. Um, we've also won 148 awards, which the, the point, point is that we put our work out in front of our peers and they judge it award winning. And that's not just because it looks good, because it's functional too, as well as makes habitat for humans. Um, so we're working on pollinator habitat, right? Well, you buy one and you get all those free. So you're putting in, you're, you're taking care of human health, people drive by this stuff and they go, ah, their blood pressure drops. You get the solar worker who goes out there, he gets to work in nature all day while he's working on a solar farm. That's a real benefit. So there's all those things, including stormwater management, biodiversity. So it's a real mix that you end up, if you solve one problem, you solve many. And it's, you know, everybody wants to think it's all rainbows and happiness and, and I kind of fancy myself a photographer. I took this at my house. But you realize that there is a storm that comes before that rainbow. And we are in that time where we're trying to fit a ecosystem restoration under a photovoltaic system. I've seen a lot of hype, but I keep seeing the same pictures. So this really is truly young that we're, you know, we're talking about putting the vegetation under there, but if you look at the, the systems that are out there, there's very few that have tried natives. And what I'll tell you again is that it isn't that easy and that education's the key. So as Vince pointed out, you have to have that contract in place and you have to educate the neighbors. You have to educate the, uh, the, the, the owner of the property. You have to educate the solar farm. Uh, the, the solar company, and that good design, that ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So like Vince said with the fescue bag on the back of the truck, if you inspect that seed and you read those labels, boy, chasing that fescue out of that site is a nightmare if that gets planted. But if you actually go in and make sure that those plants and seeds get inspected before then, you can make sure that that doesn't happen. But good design leads to easier maintenance and better performance. Because if you don't take care of invasive species, this is what happens. There's a reason they're called invasive species. And it, you don't have to play nice with them. Don't get all kumbaya on, with, on me and go, I don't want to use herbicides. Keep that tool in my toolbox. Because my goal is to get to know herbicide use. It really is. And it can happen, but I can't against that plant. Uh, or let, let me put it this way. You don't have enough money in your budget to pay me to pick each and every one of those plants, which that's what it would take if you take herbicide out. Or Phragmites. You let that get established. That's not a toy. That is an actual full-size skid steer in 18-foot Phragmites. So, 
Don't let that stuff get established. The ounce of prevention is worth the pound of cure. And if you don't do the maintenance, these are what the sites look like. This is uh, uh, Grand Ridge Solar down in, in LaSalle. We went by it. It was planted 12 years ago, had a, a, a little keg like of good mix, but it's basically defaulted to fescue. And that's, you know, uh, hey, it's better than, than exposed soil on a uh, farmland, but it's something that we, you know, would prefer that there be diversity there. So people ask, you know, isn't, aren't flowers flowers? Um, no. Uh, and I'm also going to admit, every picture of a solar farm or anything, I clipped from the web. So if I took it off your website, solar companies, or I offend you, I apologize. Because I didn't credit you right here. Um, and that's Wikipedia. Um, but it's about the birds and the bees. Everybody's talking about pollinators. You know, these the, the hives at my house. Um, I believe a gentleman over here asked about honey and hives and being in the middle of, of corn and beans. It works. My home is in the middle of 38,000 acres of corn and beans, and I have beehives on 40 acres of prairie. And I think the last harvest they did was 70 pounds of honey. So it works. Um, but it's also about the birds. You know, you create that habitat and put them together, but it's really about the birds and the bees because it's about sex, right? <laughs> sex sells, right? How do you tell the difference between a male uh, monarch and a female monarch? Huh? The dot. the dot, right? Well, you can barely see it right there. Also, color. Females are darker orange, males are lighter orange. But that's a whole lot of loving going on in that picture. Now, we're all here because of sex, right? And this has, you know, your parents should have come from different gene pools. And if they didn't, I don't want to know. But that means you're genetically unique. Just like every seed that's produced in every plant, genetic, genetic resilience leads to resiliency of the ecosystem. That is why we use genetically or uh, sexually produced plants in there. And so like, you know, uh, sex leads to an egg, to a caterpillar, to a chrysalis, and th that whole cycle is going on and an adult only lives for, for two to six weeks. I mean, we're talking about ha ha pollinator, pollinator habitat. We're talking at making sure things are around for those plants, those insects when they need it. So that's why the, the length of the uh, flowering season is important to have that because they're moving up now. You know, they started in Mexico, and they head right up, and they're going to they're gonna have generation after generation after generation, uh, uh, you know, uh, produced, and that eventually getting back to Mexico. But in each and every one of those pots, this is a, just after the burn yesterday, the, the seed head, the, the stem fell down, and every one of those seeds is genetically unique, just like us. So that gets a little drier, gets a little wetter, gets a little shadier. There's genetic uh, uh, diversity in there to allow that adaptation to that site. And so here, the iris seeds right on the wetland, ready to go, sunlight. But every one of your landscape plants, I would say almost exclusively every one of your landscape plants is produced without sex, which is a fancy way of saying cloning. So every one of your landscape plants is genetically identical. What do you think happens when the, ch the sites change on uh, or the conditions change on those sites. Now, people are saying pollinators, pollinators, we want them, we want to have them. This is why it's important. 1998, Cook County Forest Preserve, I was out with Jerry Sullivan, the ecologist, and he said, kid, document this. Lived and fed something, and it feeds things like caterpillars. Here's the black walnut, same day, downy hawthorn, same day feeding something. So why this is important to have native plants around? Because look at the species like goldenrod. They feed 115 species of just lepidopterans. This is why plant selection is important. Or the oaks that feed 534 species. That's just the moths and butterflies. That's not any, any other order of insects. And they do less than 5% damage. And yet they, people will accept 10% damage. And that's because the birds are eating. So here's 5% damage. And look, I mean, I was being an artist. I was cutting a leap up. And you can see that, really, there isn't much damage done by native insects. But this is what happens when you get non-native plants in there, is that nothing eats them. And here was a city of Maplewood in, in Minnesota who said, look at our beautiful native trees, and there's not a hole in that leaf. 
And that's really uncommon, thinking like, oh, what are they doing such that there are no insects feeding on these red oaks? But look, Phragmites in its native range, 170 species feed on it, here only five species. It's been in the US over 300 years. Or uh, purple loosestrife and causing decreased seed production out in wetlands because its pollen lands on the, on the, the, the uh, native plants and they stop reproduction. Or that purple loosestrife in the wetland is pollinated 90%, uh, better than 90% with the uh, European honeybee whereas the uh, native plant blooming at the same time is only pollinated 2.4%. So you can see, Euro European plant, European insect. And if you do that, this is 248 species of insects that can, can or, uh, have habitat with just three plants. And if you think that using horticultural varieties, because you're gonna get, that might say this might be acceptable on a project, well, that's hydrangea arborescens, that's the horticultural variety. And here's the difference in pollinators on that when they're in bloom. Notice no pollinators on, on Annabelle. And we come around here, and that's the species right next to it. Dramatic difference in horticultural varieties. How do I know that? That's my patio. I practice what I preach. So getting another horticultural variety, that's a whole lot more nothing to a, to a pollinator. But you can see the native plants really do provide habitat. And it's out on a former bean field. Even the lowly silver maple provides that habitat. But look at the little, the, the interesting things that where these insects live. So you have the two a species of wasp that forms that little capsule, or an ichneumon wasp, or a caterpillar that eats an oak leaf, or a, a, a stem miner that gets into the, you know, one of our beautiful cone flowers, but that's equally as beautiful as the flower. Or the helgramites that are in the wetland that turn into the dragonflies that, that, that fly there and eat the, the insects in the air. Or when everybody moans about the cicadas that, that come up and give us our free soil aeration. Um, and you'll never win a staring contest with a cicada. I didn't, I blinked. Now, and, and all those things that, that are out there in your landscape and the flies that are out there. You know, um, way back here, like everybody's moaning about locust bugs. Locust bugs in the landscape are good because they feed other things. And we try to get people to understand this. So this is gonna be about, you know, creating uh, information that we go out to the, the neighbors and to the regulators. You know, if, if, if they don't wanna deal with all that craziness of this kind of an ecosystem drawing, then this is easy. Or here, this is, you know, this is Delta's map of their hubs in the United States. This is easy enough to say, look, this is what the plants are and the insects are moving back and forth between them. Notice down here, there's no plant or insects going to, to our non-native plants. It's easy to communicate this to people. But I want you to understand, make no point, no, no mistake, this is about us. And this is about solar electricity. This is about sustainability because Mother Nature loves all the weeds and the, and the natives just the same. Notice she didn't stop buckthorn or phragmites from growing here. It's about us. We need those pollinators because it's up, you know, upwards of $20 billion a year in value that pollinate our food crops. But if you also write solar people, right? Solar panels perform better at cooler temperatures. So if you look at asphalt at, on a 10 o'clock on a, on a summer day, it's 102 turf grass mowed underneath a solar panel, for example, 85 degrees, that prairie is 69 degrees. That's because those roots are pulling up that water and evaporating it. That helps your system. Look at what we're doing here. So if we're, if we're doing uh, restoration only of habitats, that's what it would look like in, in, in a suburban area. If we, if we go into the open space areas, the, rest, the uh, retention systems, we could do that. But if we put native plants back in the landscape, that's how much of the picture we could actually impact. But imagine if we had solar farms and started filling those out with habitat. We would have the trifecta. This would become like a national park that you don't have to drive too far to go to. You get to see Mother Nature, and if you wanna go see Yellowstone, it's a different kind of nature. So uh, people have asked you know, in this, like, well, how are you gonna present this? And I said, well, really what we're trying to create is more like an oak savanna without the fire. Because 
we've got the cover and the sun moves up, you know, in the, in the sky or the earth moves, sun stays still. And maybe these, these panels move, maybe they don't but you're just trying to get a, a certain amount of light down to the ground so that there is enough light to cover, to, to allow those plants to grow. And we have examples out there, which are oak savannas. Now kind of comes the boring part, where in this plant selection, the primary thing is, this is about the maintenance of a solar facility, and the, the establishment and maintenance of it. This is not about kumbaya. This is not about pollinators. This wouldn't be there if there wasn't a solar facility. So we, we have to make sure that as we're looking at this, we're always looking at the, the success of the solar facility. And if we have to go to one less species or something like that, we can do that and not uh, um, and, and work with the facility rather than going with, oh, we have to have that diversity, um, like I think, uh, Vince mentioned with, you know, looking at a lower diversity, more of a coverage. And um, we do want to stick with native. Why do you want to stick with native? Because these plants evolved here. Everybody's like, well, we can get this, and it's improved, and it's new. Well, let's think about it. Since the last glaciers wiped this place clean, these plants have evolved here. This is why we stick with locally native plants. They know this ecosystem. They know it snows in April. I was reviewing pictures for the presentation last night. I have pictures of frost on May 22nd. You don't have to worry about that affecting the plants. Um, and, and the next thing would be the height. Now, when I say that height, I'm, also, I'm not only talking about the height of it right now and the height that everybody says, oh, this is only two feet tall. I'm talking about the height if you get a really wet year and a lot of lightning drops, a lot of nitrogen on those plants, and then they go whoosh, and they start growing. So that's the kind of height, ultimate height that you would have to deal with. And aesthetics. So we get, you know, people will say, well, we want it to look pretty. Well, if you're looking at pollinators, you know, you have that flush of flowers in the spring, you have your summer flowers, and then you have your fall flowers. So working for pollinator habitat actually makes it pretty. So people sometimes criticize what we do is, you know, you're working more on aesthetics. I'm like, Mother Nature's beautiful. I don't mind working on aesthetics, because if I put it all together, it's going to be beautiful, but it's going to be diverse. Um, um, allopathy, we have to worry about. When he said fescues, you have to worry about that, because those plants have underground chemical warfare. You all probably heard of black walnuts. Uh, things can't grow under black walnuts. Well, they secrete a chemical that stops other plants from growing. So you do not want to use chemical or uh, plants like the, the cereal rise, the, the, almost any of the fescues, unless you absolutely have to. Because they'll stay established and they secrete chemicals and they stop other things from growing. That's why they're ideal lawn grasses. Because they battle underneath the ground to keep other things growing. So you can't let them in. Um, the density of the seeding. Um, you know, uh, I was talking with one of the suppliers, and he mentioned the, the so, that Solar Ridge uh, uh, planting down in LaSalle County, and his uh, specification had 127 seeds per square foot. That's a good mix. That's what you need. You can't get away with eight, nine, ten seeds per square foot. You, 200 seeds per square foot would be even better. It's never, you really can't seed too heavily. And, and I say that knowing that you could. If you wanted to dump a thousand pounds per acre, that would be killer, you'd probably have overkill. But more so within budget, you can't seed too heavy because there are a million weed seeds per square foot. And if you don't start to outcompete them, you will never win the battle. So that density is important. And then pure live seed. So you're taking the seed, and you can probably the best person to answer that is Bill. Raise your hand, Bill. Bill, Bill can talk about uh, uh, you know the, the quality of seed, but understanding that what you're getting is live seed, not just raw seed. That it's been tested. We want to make sure that you have the, uh, the amount of live seed you need to get an establishment of that species. 
Um, Vince mentioned uh, inspections. Uh, we totally agree, and we're working with Vince on a project up at Pine Dunes uh, Forest Preserve, and just having everything inspected beforehand, and again, even before it's mixed, to make sure that you have the right species in the right quantities before it gets mixed together and before it gets installed. Because once it's in the ground, you ain't gonna be able to count it. Because, you know, it's gotta go in and those seeds disappear very quickly amongst dirt. Also availability. You know, the, the one thing that I would say that, you know, there are many people in the room have dealt with, which is, you know, the, the love of mother nature and they wanna get things in. But I can tell you, Commandra umbilata seed is just not available. I don't care if you design it in and you want a thousand pounds of it, nobody will be able to grow a thousand pounds of that plant. Or in a recent specification not too long ago, somebody wanted five pounds of orchid seed. And if anybody knows about orchid seed, I don't think there's five pounds of orchid seed in the world. I mean, that's how, it's, it's, it's tiny, it's dust-like. It's a naked embryo, basically. Um, so, so making sure that when the specifications are designed, it's reaching out to the suppliers and understanding that if, in the case of a solar farm, would be to go to the, the suppliers and pre-buy their uh, uh, inventory. Same thing with the plugs, is go there, work with them so that you guarantee that you will have it when you need it and not go and just put it out there and say, okay, well, here's September 1. That's going to be a scramble to get what you need or what's in the specification. So availability is important. And if you've got the time, if it's two, three, four years in the planning, you know, working with a supplier to make sure that you have the uh, uh, seeds available or the plants available. The methods of installation are uh, important because native seed needs to go in, you know, that deep, right? You got to till the soil and then you furrows, you drop it in and you cover it up, right? No, native seed goes in that deep. And if you put it in too deep, you've just planted a whole bunch of expensive organic matter. And so you have to make sure that that site is properly fine graded after the, the installation is done so that, and I'm, and I'm looking at this because we've been planted under a solar array, but that's more than likely going to be spread by a drop seeder or a rotary seeder. And you're not going to be driving a big truax drill through there. Maybe on the outside, but not on the inside. So you're going to have to make sure that you've got clean seed seed that can be able to be dispersed, but that that seed bed is ready to accept those seeds. And you might not even get the chance to rake, in, rake them in. It may be that you're planning at a point that they get worked in on their own. And also in doing this, all too often we get people designing stuff that we see with high diversity at a, in a small area. And you know what happens? It ultimately defaults to one or two species. So when it comes to these smaller areas, let's not get too aggressive in writing the, spec the uh, county ordinances, but also in the specifications uh, for the, the property that you end up putting 30 species in a small 10 foot wide strip that's 50 feet long. You may not get that establishment. You could never meet the performance criteria because the conditions aren't right for a particular species. So in smaller areas, reduce the diversity, but increase the, you'll increase the establishment. Um, and then um, when you're working with uh, the design of these sites, you'll have the perimeters, or retention areas, or areas that are not part of the active solar ar array. And then you'll have uh, you know, the areas down along the, the roadways and then areas underneath the, the solar panels. And people asked about fire. Well, in Mother Nature, we know that maintaining a healthy diversity, you need a three-year rotation of fire. Well, we're not gonna burn, that's, that's for sure. But if you have an area that's outside of that that gets actively managed with fire, and then you have you know, the, the, some areas that are, aren't burned in a year, and then you have areas that never get burned, you'll have what are called fire positive, fire neutral, and fire negative insect species habitat available. Because there are some species that don't like fire at all, and there are some species that thrive with fire. 
Um, so that way you actually can create that kind of habit that we need, habitat that we need without having to worry about you know, b burning an area that has a fire uh, negative species in it. So as you go through that, the, um, uh, the maintenance of a facility, that's the one thing that we have to, to, to worry about is that those rows between those arrays, that's a roadway. It might be a two-track roadway, but that's a roadway. And driving over top of, of, of plants like that compacts the soil and can kill them. So putting a, a heck of a lot of diversity, a heck of a lot of expensive seed in between the two panels is something that, you know, as they need to, uh, to get in there to wash them, to clean them, to knock snow off them, to, or plow to get in there and plow the snow out of the way so you can knock the snow off of them. She mentioned raising the, uh, Colleen, you mentioned raising the, the uh, height of the panels because vegetation stops the wind. And when you stop the wind, snowflakes settle out. So you're getting, you can see it out on prairies, they will capture all that snow. Therefore, a mowing prior to winter might help knock some of that down so the air keeps moving, but you still have to realize that they're gonna have to get in with vehicles to do all of that. So you can't have this incredibly amazing diverse prairie with all sorts of um, uh, uh, you know, specific and, and uh, delicate plants under where the ATVs and the pickup trucks roll. Um, because that's, in, that's about the weight of a car and, and it's PSI. Um, you know, I, I have beehives at my house, but I, I'm telling you, I, I don't like being stung by bees, and I'm not allergic. But if, there's too, if the hives are too close to where the, the solar employees are working, that could be a challenge if somebody has, has an allergic reaction. So it's making sure that there's a little bit of distance, because the bees will fly, trust me. Um, but what's interesting is that you're creating habitat for all sorts of things. Another picture I clipped off the web. I was like, any place that, that, that is protected, the wasps will build nests. So you have to be conscious that that's part of what we're creating is habitat. Um, but one of the other things that, that, that I was thinking about in long term, you're talking a 25 year site. I mean, I can't even be guaranteed my house will be around in 25 years. But there will be the, the, the solar array because it's been set up with the, you know, all of the contractual issues. But if there's an area that gets disturbed, you will need to have a maintenance mixture in there. If there's an area that gets completely disturbed during construction, so a couple of minor tire ruts need to be fixed, that's this mixture. But if there is something, if you have a damage done, a solar panel, hailstorm, and they need to get in and fix it, and you need to cover that soil so it doesn't erode, you better have a maintenance mixture listed in there, and it might be a spring mix and a fall mix because of the, the different types of, of things that will cover the, the ground and stop it from, from eroding, eroding. And then you might, you're gonna have to have a temporary mix. It might be something you'll just put out there in July to cover the site to, to protect the soil from eroding until you can get in there in August or September and do the final seeding. So these are all things that need to be planned out. Um, and then those, as Finch mentioned, the erosion control, that just making sure that, you know, that it's uh, available, that especially if you're getting into a disturbance that happens on site, whether that's erosion control blanket or silt fence, to protect that area during its establishment. Um, this is something that uh, I heard many years ago, but it's just simply, geology dictates hydrology. The way the land was laid down dictates the way the water moves on it. And that hydrology dictates the ecology of the site. So if it's all sloped facing south and drains really quick, you can better believe that it's going to be a hot, dry ecosystem that goes out there. You know, And this is not one size fits all. It is very site specific. Somebody asked the question about 1,000 acres. You can better believe there might even be 1,000 different seed mixes that go out there but that ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Spend time putting those together and you will better set yourself up for success. And that everything is local. And that you may have to be dealing with local issues that, you know, the, the, the wet and the dry. So high dry part of a site, a low wet, or a wet year. I mean, I've seen some sites that when the rain came, like last year, 
uh, we saw plants grow to 12 feet tall that we would never thought got above six feet. They just took off in all that rain and humidity. So you have to be conscious of that. Um, the soil types you're gonna need to know, um, the rocky soils you mentioned, mowers hitting rocks. In some of these areas, you cannot get away from rocks. You couldn't even clear all the rocks because the first frost will push a whole bunch more up. And that ends up being that, uh, you know, you, you just have to deal with that. That means you have to adjust the kind of mowers you use. Um, the, uh, we just uh, got into a contract with a uh, place in Chicago that they're replacing all the mowed grass because the contractor has broken the last of, thir of, of the windows that cost $30,000 each to replace. So they're putting back in native plants so they don't have to mow anymore. See, saves money. Um, you know, the size of the planting areas, again, like the, the, the species in there, the size of the site, you may want to be able, you can create different habitats, two different types of plantings on two different dry sites. Um, the topography, you know, how, how it goes down. I can tell you, you might go out there and break drain tiles or you might install drain tiles, but you don't know exactly how the, how the hydrology is gonna work until you've seen the site, you know, in place. So the planting zones are, uh, uh, you know, gonna, gonna vary a little bit. So that's where these mixes have to have some crossover when you're laying them out. Obviously your county and city regulations, the sun, the shade, but also I want you to be fire wise. Bill mentioned fire. It's not something you want on a, a solar farm. Um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But you can see when they build them, they beat up the soil. So as you're uh, laying out the specifications for the, the contractor, make sure that, that minimal soil compaction, and if they do heavily compact something, they might have to rip it, break it up, uh, allow it. Adding mycorrhizal fungi to the mix helps break up the soil. That fungus gets out there and breaks it apart. I've got plants, native plants, growing on pure clay because we inoculate with the mycorrhizal fungi. But you also have to understand that you know there's there's the underground, knowing that this might be an area where they'll have to go in and fix something. So don't put the diversity there. Put the diversity uh, over here. So you've got your perimeter areas. You've got your uh, you know, areas in between the uh, uh, arrays, and then you've got the areas under the arrays. Those are, in addition to the dry, the wet, you know, those are all the different con uh, constraints that you'll have to deal with when putting this together. And there's many ways that you can put them down. Hand seeding might be for repairs, the drill or drop seeding, broadcast seeding, frost seeding that you put it down. Like that's the soil when the, uh, when the freeze-thaw cycle happens. You can see each day building up another layer of ice as the, the uh, uh, freeze-thaw is going on. And if you put the seeds in right on top of that, when that collapses with it, it plants that, those seeds right at the proper level. And you'll have plugs. Now what, the, what, what you do with plugs is to make an instant impact or you're planting species that don't propagate well from seed or don't produce seed at all. Um, so plugs come in generally, you know, little pots about that big, about that deep. And so you might bring something in for instant impact around the entryway or at the ends of every aisle, but you know, plugs are expensive. It's a lot cheaper to seed something than to plant plugs in. But if you want to create habitat, you know, it's something like Culver's root which is a really nice plant, pollinators love it, but it rarely uh, comes from seed in the field. But you put it in a flat in the nursery and it grows like crazy. So it's, th th that's, it's something that each site is, is, uh, is uh, unique in which the species that they can use. I did, I mean, in doing research for this, I mean, a lot of it is in the UK. But this is their, and, and nothing against American meadows, but this is their, uh, fescue mix, all it is is no mow fescue. So it's the stuff if you golf that in between the fairways that's about that tall and looks ugly in the summer because it gets, gets really dry, that's all it is. You don't even have to go to American Meadows to buy it, you can buy it from any grass seed dealer. So it's not something that, you know, it, it, it wouldn't be uncommon to do it. But as we talk about fire, this might be something that could help. So how do we pick species? Here's a, uh, the USDA plant map. You can see that 
this is the na native range of a particular native plant. Would you plant it in that county? Yeah. Would you plant it over there? No. That's how simple it is. We, look, we use uh, references like that. And note that plants also grow with associates. You f when you find one, you're likely to find another. And here's plants of the Chicago region. I mean, this is a great planning uh, list for uh, uh, a solar farm if you base it on uh, drop seed, because almost everything except a few plants in there are nice and short, because that's a dry prairie plant. So you, get, you don't want to use things like um, uh, prairie dock, but gentians, they'd be really pretty. Give you the color that starts in September, August and September, you know, and, and is great for bumblebees. You know, early spring colors, again, you can see genetic diversity. Look at the flower color difference on these spiderwort. A, a Canada anemone, if it's a wet area, that grows like a ground cover and just spreads out. So I mean, it'd be something that if the soil's a little bit moist, be a great plant to put in there. Or pale purple coneflower. I mean, you rarely, I mean, that's a pale purple coneflower in one of our rhizotrons, but that's about as tall as it'll get. You got great, you know, flowers, it's foliage there for bugs to eat too. Um, you know, some things like quinine, this is a fly pollinating quinine. But this is not a plant you're going to want in a solar farm. And that's common milkweed. It's the one that everybody associates with monarchs. Why? Because in a wet year, that thing can get five to six feet tall. I have milkweeds that are right by my sidewalk that are six feet, seven feet tall in, uh, in, in wet years. So it's something that we'd want to, those would be planted out, you know, maybe on the perimeter, but don't plant those near the panels if the panels are three feet off the ground. Because everybody knows those nice little parachutes that poof, they get dry on a fall day and all of a sudden poof, they're flying all over the place. And then if you knock up something to the ground, they're all there ready to go. Realize also that in doing this, you're creating habitat and that other things will come like additional uh, uh, rodents, but then other things come to eat the rodents. That is my screen porch. That is a badger. Yeah, that's a weasel that gets, is, is, has a really bad attitude. <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're out there. But I mean, it's great. They create incredible diversity on a prairie. I mean, where the, the, weasel, the badgers went through my prairie, they the uh, violets are exploding there, which is great bumblebee habitat. But that thing has claws and teeth and probably isn't compatible with, you know, exposed wires. But also realize that those mice and those ground squirrels, the, a lot of this, the, what I found and learned with my truck is that the, the coverings of the wiring contain cornstarch or corn products and mice like to chew them. And we're creating habitat for mice. So now, this was the thing about fire. Everybody, I talked to a bunch of people and they kind of laughed, ha, lightning strike fires. Well, we're creating a, a, a huge planting that is C4 grasses, which means they're warm season grasses and they dry out and they become very flammable. But you can get a spark from a cutting torch, grinding, you know, uh, welding, tosses their cigarette. Hopefully they're not kicking back, you know, uh, blowing a joint on the job site, but, you know, lay down, fall asleep. But this is dry stuff. And I want to show you something. This is a buffalo grass, and this is my buffalo grass lawn, which would be a great plant to grow underneath the, the uh, because of its eight foot deep root system. But look what happens to three and a half inches of buffalo grass, this was two days ago, when you light it on fire. I'm not the be best videographer. Now watch it spread. What would happen if that were underneath, that mowed area underneath the solar array? I have been in fires all over the country. That scares me because that, the speed at which that moves on flat land, because the fuels are so contiguous, they're so fine, they dry out so fast. So I, I, I say as part of this, 
And again, this is what, what we're having to work with. We're working with a lot of warm season plants that'll create dry things that can burn, is that if you have that, maybe one of the things that to mitigate that is to get some grazing in there to knock that stuff down, to reduce the fuel continuity, um, to, to trample it down, to get it closer to the ground, to make it wet. But, I, you know, to me, I'm, I, I'm not the optimist, I'm the pessimist. And so I always look to figure out what could go wrong and try to mitigate that. Um, so he, they're going to talk about the, the things you do in stewardship. And I'm just going to leave it there because I'm like, what, 10 minutes? Oh, five minutes. There we go. So I'll open it up to questions. Come on, I, I didn't put garlic in my coat. Yeah, yes, Dennis. <laughs> Colleen, that's a great story, by the way. So I want to go back to the, uh, the fire question. It's come up several times. We've learned that our native landscapes have evolved with fire. They thrive with fire. Every seminar I've been to, in my own personal experience, suggests that this kind of a planting really needs fire in the long term. But then we're saying we can't do that. So I guess one question, and you showed the buffalo grass, and you don't think that's going to work. Um, are there sedges that we can plant? Is there anything we can plant that will allow fire? So that's the first part of my question, things that would be lo very low growing. The second part of my question, if fire is simply not feasible in these situations, what native plants can we plant, especially pollinators and some type of an understory grass sedge mixture, would be more likely to thrive and still be functioning as a native healthy system 10, 20 years down the road, versus turning to, you know, a, um, a cool season grass mix and just, it's all gone. So, kind of a complicated question, but a two-part question. So, my undergraduate's in horticulture. And so when you learn to uh, grow plants ornamentally, you realize that pretty much every plant's native somewhere. Hosta's native somewhere, right? And if we look at this, we don't need fire. Um, I'll be the first to say it. I sit on a state board that's, that certifies burn managers. You don't need fire. You can accomplish what fire would do by just mowing it, raking it all off, and taking it away. Because what does fire do? It's a spring cleanup. It exposes the soil to sunlight, makes the soil warmer, drier. There you go. Our plants will grow fine without fire in this situation. It's a lot easier to do fire on a big area because it's, boom, done. There goes an acre, done. Um, but in this case, you would mow. And you'd plant the plants at like cooler temperatures. Um, so more cool seeds, more C3 grasses. So Canada rye, Virginia rye. Uh, uh, what's the one with the edges? Uh, bunch grass, or uh, I'm gonna, uh, it always, you stick your hand in it, it just has razor-like, uh, not cord grass. Tufted hair grass, Discampsia cespitosa. Um, Something like that would, would do fine. It doesn't need to be burned. Um, but because there's areas and you can't do that, you know, some of these areas you might cut it and then haul it out. You know, there might be a way to take and hay it off, uh, you know, at the end of the season. But, you know, I, I don't really see that's a problem in a solar farm. That could we design and find a mix of plants that would work where we cannot bring fire. We just have to make sure, that's why I'm thinking with some kind of grazing, you could help pull some of that stuff out of there, mm -hmm. that biomass. So therefore, the soil's exposed. Mike, hi. Um, what if, if common milkweed would be too tall, what about other milkweeds like swamp milkweed? Oh, yeah, completely. I mean, the, the, nothing wrong with, with common milkweed. It's just that you give it some water and the right soils, and it can get six to seven feet, and if it's above those photo or those uh, uh, solar panels, it's gonna block the sunlight. Any other milkweeds would do fine, as long as they don't, you know, in a wet year, get, get really tall. And that's again why I think her suggestion of raising the, the bottom level of the, the panels is important. I know that adds steel and cable, but, you know, it just makes it help uh, a little easier for all of us on the, on the back end. Yeah, with the, the county building this year, we had uh, uh, butterfly milkweed and world milkweed, and uh, we just had a banner year with monarchs. So uh, oh. you can use other things other than the common milkweed. 
I was just wondering if you would uh, put goats or sheep on there all season, growing season, or just at the end of the year to clean up. I'm sorry, the goats and sheep at the, at the Goats or sheep for grazing the prairie and the panels, or would you just do that in the fall to clean up? I wouldn't do it all year because, you know, obviously they'd be eating the, the plants as they grew. Um, I, I would say that, that maybe as a method of being firewise at the end of the year, let them move through. Obviously, you don't want goats because you don't want them up on the panels, but, you know, you could do something, you know, rabbits would be great. Rabbits don't seem to bother electrical cables, but um, you want to make something that, you know, keeps that vegetation down because, the, you know, short fuel like that in the right conditions can be explosive. And like I said, you're welding a, a you know, a broken arm back onto a, a support uh, structure and uh, therefore, I think that is incumbent upon the, the solar companies to make sure that their employees know about that, to make sure that they're fire wise and fire trained. Just one other thing regarding uh, mowing. One of the concerns is for nesting bird habitat, and our current performance standards do recommend mowing, uh, but after September 15th, uh, so you allow for the plants to flower and, and go to seed, and uh, not after uh, May 15th. Right. Uh, or March 15th, uh, right. so that uh, you've got a window uh, for to, to mow, but uh, to allow for other species to thrive. Yeah, my home, the metal arcs were there a week ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Jack. Um, we've heard from the agrarian community that drain piles are super important, uh, not only to protect, but to make sure that they function properly uh, as existing. Um, and from a different presenter, we saw the root system of crops versus native plants. And I don't know if you can speak to um, maintenance requirements or any consideration to uh, how drain piles are protected uh, by planting species. The, I'm sorry, so the maintenance requirements of these native plants, is that what you said? I guess the crux of it is how do we prevent the drain tiles from being clogged by the root system of these plants? Sorry, I wear hearing aids, and it just didn't seem to adjust really well to this, so the, the, the joys of getting old and having worked around machinery. Drain tiles, not a problem. Uh, even, even out on the, the sites that we've seen it, the drain tiles don't seem to, to be uh, inhibited by the depth of the native plants and the root systems. I, even on my site where I've got a couple of blown out tiles, you look down there and the, and the, the, the native plants aren't in there. So I wouldn't worry about it. On the other hand, if you can break the drain tiles and you create the, the restore the, the hydrology of an area, that, that, that will help too. So if you want them in, also rep replacing them before you do your, your solar farm, if, if you're worried about the, the solar farm is in the drainage pattern, get those replaced before you do it, because uh, it, it'd be almost impossible to do it after that if those tiles blow up. Any other last question? One, one more. So without the county's requirement for you to using these natives, can you see other developers, solar developers, uh, choosing to use natives, natives because of the advantages we've been talking about? Yeah, I, I, I can see it. I can see it, it makes sense. I'm, you know, it's also, how many people in here want to, or, or need to employ millennials? Yeah, yeah. I have 100, over 100 employees now. I, I have to employ millennials and I have to keep them. If you do something, they all want to save the world, you get, that's the one way you can keep them engaged is that if they know that the company's doing the right thing. And turf grass versus, versus natives, you're, that's the right thing. And the millennials will want to be there as part of that company. If you're just doing it the same old way, man, I don't care if you pay them a dollar more, I've watched them walk. So that's a really important thing about keeping the millennials and planning natives. And this will be our last question now. Lucky me. Um, thank you. Huh? I have, so we've been working with the county on uh, you know, getting the, the uh, native pollinator plants in the, in the unified development ordinance. But do we have anybody here from any municipalities? Because that, that's something that the environmental defenders will be advocating for as well. 
to be sure that our villages and our cities um, are also, when they are putting in solar, community solar, will be doing the same thing. I don't know if we have anybody here, but we will definitely be advocating for that um, going forward. Yeah, I mean, I, we, we haven't dealt with any uh, municipal solar, but we know that the municipalities and the park districts are uh, all putting in, you know, and restoring natural areas. So I don't think it would be hard to, to make the flip the switch to have them go, all right, all right, let's do it over there, and if they have solar uh, panels in their community. Thank you so much, Jack. Oh, you're uh, can we have a hand of applause for both for Jack and Vincent?